right, welcome on in, guys, to the Falls Count Anywhere podcast here on August 5th of 2023. Charlie Turner, Chris DiCarlo, John Restino, all here with you. You know, gentlemen, right off the bat, you know, we um, we usually end our show with like a PSA, public service announcement. We like to say we're a show to the people, get some helpful information. I'm going to start the show with that because uh, of personal experience, I had to get my bunghole blown out with some prep uh, drink and I had to get a, a colonoscopy this past week. And let me tell you something. Last An important time. announcement for anybody over 45, get your butthole checked. It's important, okay? I had to go through it, and I'd hate to be the only one going through that process of, <laughs> of the damn cleaning out, um, and it was horrible. But um, it's important, guys. You know, guys over 45, get your colon checked, get your prostate checked. It's very important. If you want to live long, get ahead of any problems that might be uh, going on down there. And, again, it totally sucked, but recommend doing it because they give you some good drugs during the operation. So that's the uh, – yeah, I want to start out with a PSA, so there it is, guys. Excellent. <laughs> Talking sure. about my, my butthole at the beginning of the show. That's, that'll pull, that'll pull in the listeners. Um, <laughs> but, guys, we uh, of course, we are uh, talking some classic uh, pro wrestling today. And, uh, of course, we're, we're bringing back uh, some return guests uh, to talk uh, some classic wrestling. And it's a great combination we got going today, Chris. So go ahead and uh, give these gentlemen their proper introduction. Yes, of course, this is our... Uh positive feedback once a month show with our panel that uh, stays the same but changes every month and first uh, we'd like to introduce from uh, West Virginia the Wrestling Legends Network a friend of ours friend of the show Mr. Adam Parsons. Hey guys how y'all doing? Good good Adam welcome back. Yep good to be here. Also next uh uh, again, another friend, wrestling historian of the AWA, but all the territories out of Minnesota, Mr. George Shire. Good morning, guys. Nice to meet you, Adam, and uh, your PSA. Good thing, Charlie. It's all behind you now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it certainly is, man. And uh, yeah, the probing was a, was a really good time. <laughs> hey, the good thing about it is that uh, you said if you're over 45 and you live longer, I've, I've had a few of them, and I'm way over 45, so, so there yes, you go. Do Adam, it's something for you to look forward to down the road, buddy. <laughs> i got about 20 years before I hit that age. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> and uh, also uh, another friend, wrestling historian from Manitoba, Canada, Mr. Wes Maidman. Hey, guys. Good morning, and uh, I concur, George. I've had the procedure done uh, quite a few times myself, protecting your Butthole. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> this, yes, is what it, this is what it's come to. We're talking buttholes. We're, we're old. We're old. Holy <laughs> shit. Yeah. My wow. ass specifically. <laughs> and hey, the good news is peace of mind. I'm all clean. So it's all, I'm all yeah. good. So it's a beautiful thing. It is. Hey, I'm 48, but I don't like to be old. <laughs> right. Even though I got gray hair. Anyway, well, old, is, old, old is better than not being anything. Yeah. Think about that, it. There you go. Right. Anyway, uh, okay, <laughs> as we do this show every month, we know we have a couple of clips. We go to commercial, we come back with our clips, and uh, we get everybody's feedback. Uh, my disclaimer that I say each and every week here, I do not sell these tapes or clips. I do not trade them to anybody. They are my own personal collection for our enjoyment of the show. And, uh, John, let's see what we got for number one. All right. One moment, please. Uh, here comes number one. I believe these are all strong men. Oh, 
ゴリラモンスーン全 AWA。Oh, that guy's squaring up with the referee there. What was going on there? <laughs> so basically, that was a, a, I called it strong wrestlers. And of course, we started with Ken Patera, who we recently had on the show, and Harley Race and Haku, which we've heard about. So, and then of course, we saw Andre the Giant, Big John Stud. So strong、yeah. and big, I guess you could say. Chris, who was the last guy there that was in Japan? He had black long tights on, rather.、Uh, that was a giant Baba. No, no, the, the American guy. Was it Bruno? Oh, yes. It was Baba against Monsoon and then Baba against Monsoon. Bruno. Monsoon. Monsoon. We just、oh, saw it.、Wow. Okay. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing, guys, is as, you, as I looked at just those clips, and as you say, strong men,、uh, I think it's important to say right up front that probably. The two best of the entire group that you showed and are legitimate, just tough, was Haku and Harley Race. Yeah. Those two guys, I mean, seriously, I have never heard a wrestler that said they wanted to mess with either one of them. And I think if you were in a, in a dark alley and you wanted somebody to have your back, I think Race or Haku would be the guys that you'd want because, and as Harley used to say, I have no conscience when it comes to. Taking somebody out that deserves it.、Yeah. So, and we have that interesting story in Minnesota with Harley early in his career、um, when he was at the Chestnut Tree Lounge in downtown Minneapolis. This was in January of 65. And、uh, he ended up getting stabbed, took on three guys that were beating up on a woman. Oh, wow. And,、uh, and this hit the newspapers and it was out of character at the time because he was a heel. Yeah. And he got into it with these guys. He took the first two guys out, I mean, like solid. <laughs> and the third guy came up behind him and put a, a pen knife in Harley's back, right on the, on the heart side of his back.、Ooh. And he was out of action for、uh, a couple weeks. <clears throat> and they made the papers. And when he came back, he got introduced on All Star Wrestling as, you know, Wrestling fans back, Harley Race, and the fans cheered him in the studio audience. And the bell rang. Harley started. It was a tag match. <clears throat> Harley started the match. He went in and just started kicking the crap out of his, his opponent, which would have been a TV jobber at the time. And within, I swear, within about 15 seconds, everybody in that studio was booing Harley Race again.、Huh. And Harley said afterwards, He said, I knew I had to get my heat back. Yeah. And he did it. But、uh, for those of you that followed Harley's career, if you see any pictures of him on clips or whatever, you can still see that. You know, you could always see that moon shaped scar on his back. Ah, interesting. He carried it the rest of his life. But he was a tough son of a gun.、Um, that's the story on Harley. So. A couple, couple of former kings. It was King Harley Race and King Haku at one point. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Wes, Adam. Go ahead, Adam. I would say、um, I agree with everything there about Harley. And I think when you look back in the history of strong men and guys like that, I don't think that Patera really gets enough credit. Um, you know, he was Missouri heavyweight champion and intercontinental champion at the same time and was still making some shots for Vern in big towns. And he was working a program in Jerry Lawler in Memphis. And he was working for Eddie Graham in Florida all at the same time. Other than Andre, Ernie Ladd, there's not too many guys you could say that are that bigger stature that were really a sellout box office guy everywhere they went. And there was about a four year period there where Patera was just. At an unbelievable position in the business. And I think over time, that's kind of just been lost of how big of a star he really was.、Yeah. I, I think that、uh, seeing Andre there, and I, I only saw him at the later part of his career, it would have been interesting to see him in a match when he had first started in Montreal, because you, alive, he would have been able to probably feel his strength more when you saw him basically say, throw someone into the turnbuckles or whatever. Um, I, I couldn't even imagine how strong Andre really was. It, it's, it's bizarre to think that someone that huge 
and wasn't overly muscular, but just just the <laughs> enormity of his body would be able to just pick up people without even blinking, probably. You know, I had the chance to see Andre on his AWA debut. It was July 24th of 1971. And he had come in announced as Andre Rusimov. Um, and he came in as a surprise tag team partner for Bull Belinsky, who was Frank Shields. The uh, Bull was in a feud with a uh, program with uh, against Larry Hennig and Lars Anderson at the time. And uh, Bull said he had a surprise partner and he brought in this, you know, almost eight foot giant. Now in 71, Andre was a lot slimmer. Yeah, um, I can tell you that night in Minneapolis when I saw him, um, I was in I was in amazement at his size. Of course, he was a lot faster, more agile in the ring. He was I mean, it was obvious, you know, the guy was 40 years younger, 30 years younger. But um, when he I remember him tossing both Larry and Lars into the ropes and you could see the force that he did it. Now, I always take in mind that, you know, Hennig and Anderson were helping him, you know, part of the in the running, et cetera. But um, there was no doubt that he was impressive. And, you know, that was just the start of his regular visits here. And then, like you say, he was an attraction wrestler. He could go around all over the country, yeah. and which is what he did until he landed the last few years of his career in the uh, WWF, you know, towards the end when he was going to give the torch to Hogan, et cetera. But I, I, definitely a force. I And a lot of people have said uh, you didn't want him mad at you because, mm -hmm. you know, obviously he's going to take your eyeballs out and feed them to you. You know, right. <laughs> you know I was just uh, I was just watching the uh, the Bam Bam Bigelow uh, documentary, The Dark Side of the Ring, and, and they were talking about his story. And his first run in WWF in 87 he was teaming up with Hulk Hogan. He was in main event matches. And Andre took exception to that. He said he's too green. He shouldn't be in the main event picture yet. So when Andre got a hold of him, it ended up being Bigelow's uh, last match in his first run with WWF. When Andre got a hold of him, he absolutely, and they showed clips of the match, he absolutely brutalized Bam Bam Bigelow. And this is, you know, they're talking up Bigelow like being beast from the East. He's 300 pounds. He's beating up guys in bars. Andre got a hold of him and humbled his ass. And it was like, man, Andre the Giant was just a different on a different level, man. He was the measuring stick. And we also know from Ken Patera a couple of weeks ago, guys, that uh, he could drink 116 beers and then go <laughs> right. in a circle. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing about Andre is I I don't think he knew his own size or his own strength. And but when you say he, you know, pounded on Bigelow. I find that to be interesting because a lot of times the guys that were in the business as let's just say veterans, they had some years behind them. A lot of the veterans, you know, took offense sometimes in, in that era and before at some younger upstart coming in and getting a push yeah. regardless of how warranted it may have been yeah. uh, because they realized these veterans, they realized that they had to, you know, earn their oats. They had to put their time in. And, you know, it was really interesting because in the territory days, when a wrestler would start in the business, regardless of how good he may have been, with but the rarest exception, he had to go two, three, four, five years traveling around, gaining the experience, picking up what he can from everybody, you know, and make his own character. Yeah. But very seldom, like I say, with but the rarest examples, uh, very seldom was a guy able to come in, you know, like it happened later on. And I don't know, maybe Adam, you'd be able to uh, talk on this. But it seemed as the wrestling progressed to the uh, modern era, all a guy had to do was be six foot, 10 inches tall and built like a brick, you know what house. And he was given main events and the guy probably couldn't move or wrestle. And other guys had to really make him look better than he would ever be. And I think that's where the rub came in. So I get it. I never really agreed with it, but. I think that's what the deal was with Andre. You know, he was just saying, hey, look, I had to pay my dues. Even I had to pay my dues. You're right. Yeah. And like, uh, some guy and he's a big event. George, a guy like John Nord out of uh, your area. Yeah. Pushed right yeah. away. Yeah. John, and John Nord was one of those exceptions to the rule. Uh, you know, he was he was a big guy. He was muscular. 
he was powerful and uh, he was just kind of elevated, but the, the era was going to that. Yeah. Now, when I say about earning your oats, use Nick Bockwinkel. Nick started wrestling in 1954, guys, and he had a great experience from trainers Lou Thez and Wilbur Snyder and his daddy. And he gets into the business, and for about the first 10 years, he's floating around mid-card, maybe some minor main events, but mid-card as young Nicky Bockwinkel. Yeah. He was in the business for close to 15 years before he started getting the major push. He earned it. And, uh, you know, and Nick was one of those guys that said that, that we enjoyed having to earn it and we appreciated it when we got it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, guys, John, let's go to our second clip. All right. One second. The talent in this area of international wrestling, the likes of Dino Bravo, Jacques Rougeau Jr., Ah, uh, some great masked wrestlers. Dino Bravo? Going to town on Dino. Bang! As the bell sounded, we saw a very, very trick in the trade. It's called Wrestling 2. This crowd is already... Wow. Yeah. Now, Lucha Libre's aside, man, the, the um, masked wrestlers are kind of extinct these days. Yeah. I mean, there's outside of Rey Mysterio, I don't think there's anyone uh, on national television that wears a mask. And for about the last 30 years, outside of maybe Psychosis wearing one in WCW and La Parca. Yeah. Right. You know, there haven't been a lot of masked guys. Um, in wrestling at that level, um, and it's uh, it's a tough pick for me out of out of those three uh, what I consider mainstay Georgia guys and Mister Wrestling Two Bob Armstrong and Bill Eady, but those three would certainly be my top three. I just don't know where I would rank them as far as who is the best. You yeah. know, I think you touch on something very important when you say and they're not around today, and I think we realize that it, the the masked gimmick cannot work today for the most part because of, you know, the kayfabe is gone and the, the media is so, you know, as soon as the guy comes out, everybody knows who he is and it's nanoseconds all over social media. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. When you look at that era, when the wrestlers, everyone we saw, we saw Don Jardine as the spoiler. We saw Bill Eady. We saw the destroyer, Dick Byer. Uh, we saw Johnny Walker as Mr. W, Mr. Wrestling 2. We saw... Um, I think the Super Destroyers were in there, weren't they? The Irwin brothers? Super Destroyer and Mass Superstar were attacked. Okay, yeah, it was Bill, it was Scott Irwin then. And then uh, we also saw the Assassins, which, you know, if you look at tag teams or mask guys uh, from the kayfabe era, I think definitely the Assassins and the Dick Byers Destroyer. I think Bill Eady has to fit in there because as Mass Superstar, he was phenomenal. And I found it interesting with Johnny Walker, you know, he had been around the business for decades, guys. He wrestled as Johnny Walker early in his career. He's a baby face. 
he wrestled as a heel um, under a mask called the Grappler in, mm -hmm. I believe, well, it was Florida. And then later on, he landed this Mr. W2 with Tim Woods being number one, Mr. Wrestling. And uh, the rest of his career, I mean, he spent it as a mask guy and finished out. But what a gimmick. You know, it, it worked so good at the box office. Who is this guy? Fans, yeah. we don't, you know, the promoters would say, we don't know where they come from. We don't know who they are. And here he is. And every wrestler on the roster wanted to get a match with him to beat him or, or unmask him. It was almost like a title belt or a championship, that yeah, match. Sure. And yeah. who, who's going to be the one to unmask him? And uh, so, yeah, great gimmick that just sadly is lost with the times. And I, I it would not work today. So uh, I, yeah. really, I really miss it. That's a good point, George. I, I remember... And this was like when the internet was first kind of coming around. Um, so it wasn't what it is today, obviously. But when when Owen Hart was the Blue Blazer, people kind of knew, yep. well, that's Owen Hart. You know what I mean? So exactly. it was kind of kind of the lost art at that point. So yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, we have not seen a other than the Lucci Libre guys that you know Adam touched on and Mysterio, Mysterio, and uh, I know you said somebody else. Psychosis. Psychosis. Yes, we just. We have not had a mask guy since in, in the WWF. And I use WWF because it's when this happened. Yeah. Uh, we had the machines, yeah. the super machines. It was B Bill Eady, John Studd, um, Andre, of course. And then they, they put a bunch of other guys. We had Crusher Machine and yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> anything that would to a terror. Washing machine. They, they, <laughs> washing, <laughs> yeah, washing machine. They never, Vince never <laughs> thought of that one. Uh, would have worked. It was in a ring, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, it was a great make like a great era, and I, I'm sad that you know fans today that are older or that you know younger than I am, they haven't had the opportunity to see it. I want to tell you a quick story. Dick Byer was Doctor X here in AWA, and of course for three years, the introduction. We don't know where he comes from. We don't know who he is. Doctor X. And, I, and I'm, I'm what, uh, 14, 15 years old, 16 years old at the time. I said to my dad, I said, how does the guy go to the bank with a check made out to Dr. X? And when they ask him for identification, he says, I got a mask on. You, know, you, don't, go, you don't go to a bank with a mask on until COVID hit, you know, right. which, which was odd. But, uh, yeah, that always bothered me that they're saying they don't know who he is, you know. And, uh, and of course, Dr. X was one of my personal buddies over the years. Great guy. So anyway, yeah. that's my two cents. How, how, do, how do you not know who they are? Right. When I was growing up in the magazines of the mask guys was just incredible. There was a ton of them in the early, late 60s, early 70s. Every territory had mask guys. And um, I, I remember in Toronto, there was uh, the Stomper who was Guy Mitchell under a mask. And then, yeah. plus we also got in Ontario, we also got the BC uh, TV and he was Mr. X out there. And and you wouldn't have known the difference I, I, as a 12 or 14 year old or whatever, right? Oh my God, it's another mask guy. And look, at he's just so great. Um, I, I remember I met Dick Byer at one of the Titans dinners in Toronto and it was um, he was getting a little crippled at the time. And it was just such a treat. I helped walk him out to the car, got him in the car, gave his wife directions how to get back home. And just a really cool, super cool guy. And uh, he he just, it seemed like he absolutely loved the gimmick as much as, in a nice way, um, as anybody who loved him as a, as a wrestler, right? Uh, uh, but I have to admit, the Mass Superstar, definitely one of the guys I saw um, Mid-Atlantic, he was so good, just so good. Uh, I, I can't even explain. We, we all know how good he was. We don't have to say anything. He was just a great wrestler. And to take that facial expressions away, and all it was was his arms and his body movements and his lang language of his body, he, yeah. he just personified uh, a hidden uh, persona of who he really was, but he was just so good. 
Well, you know, when the masked gimmick in the territory days, when it was used correctly, it was money in the bank. I mean, any baby, you know, most of them were heels, most of the mask guys. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the fans literally would line up at the ticket office in those days to be there the night that that, that guy might get unmasked. And, you know, there was always the guessing game. And when you mentioned the destroyer, you know, again, he was one of the, well, he took it to a different level because his contract, his whole gimmick was, I will not be unmasked as the destroyer. He, that was his career. Once he put that mask on in 1962, he was not going to unmask for any promoter for some match, even if he was leaving the territory. And when he came to the AWA, that was the part that, that was the reason he changed to Dr. X because Vern told him, Vern Gagne told him when your run is done, I want you to unmask and buyer said, "Uh -uh, it ain't going to happen. So they come up with the idea of a different mask guy. And that was Dr. X. So when his three year run was done, uh, Dick agreed to be unmasked and, but the destroyer was never unmasked. And when Dr. X was unmasked, in, uh, it happened in three or four of the towns in the AWA, the bigger towns. And uh, in three of them, they identified him as Bruce Marshall. Oh, <laughs> who, who the heck is Bruce Marshall? You know, right. and what it was, it was a made up name. Dick told me later on that it was it was a it was actually a rib on two friends. They had put the names together and he was Bruce Marshall. OK, only in St. Paul when he was unmasked was he announced as Dick Byer, and then he left. He wrestled without his mask that night after he took he took it off in St. Paul to get a match with Black Jack Lanza. That's how the thing ended. But as it turned out, Dick, uh, the Destroyer was never unmasked. And uh, when Dick came back a couple of years later as Dr. X again, he was now a baby face, and there was no mention of his ever being unmasked or that he was Dick Byer. He was just Dr. X and the fans no longer cared if he got unmasked because he was a baby now. Yeah. So then when the, the heel pulled on the mask, they were, you know, having the referee make it stop. They turned the gimmick around and it was it was good. Right here from uh, Western New York, Mr. Uh, Dick to the Story of Byer from Buffalo. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, two yeah. things, Adam, uh, which you can, you know, I'm going to say. Uh, number one, uh, and John, too, a lot of people here. Uh, Sweet Ebony Diamond, the original Rock, Rocky Johnson, took the mask off there after winning the NWA TV title in Mid-Atlantic in uh, 81-ish. And then also I heard a story that was true. Uh, Mr. Wrestling number two, Johnny Walker, uh, went to the White House to meet President Carter with the mask on. Huh. Yeah, yeah that, 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 was was in the, that was in the magazines, too. Yeah. Um, Lillian Carter, Jimmy's mother, yeah. was uh, allegedly a wrestling fan. And, you know, that was at the height of Mr. W's popularity. And he wasn't going to take his mask off even for that. So he took the gimmick as seriously as Bayer did towards the end of his career. I wanted to point out, too, in one of the clips, you guys, when we're talking about wrestling, too, uh, one of the clips had him wrestling Butch Reed, a younger mm-hmm. Butch Reed. And... Uh, Butch Reed had a brief run with a mask as uh, with oh, Ron yeah. Simmons when yeah. they were um, Doom. 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 That's right. And, yeah. and I thought I thought that was pretty cool when they it was woman they had as their yeah. manager um, uh, Sullivan Nancy Sullivan. So they yeah, kick ass team for that, sure. That was that was a, a cool clip and uh, but he, it was short lived. Go ahead, Adam. I was just going to touch on. Um, Mr. Wrestling 2 with, you know, you were talking about, George was talking about kayfabe is the reason why that won't work. And uh, Johnny Walker used to mow his grass with his mask on. Uh, (laughs) He had had a separate mask that he showered with in the shower. It was a waterproof material, and he would even wear his mask in the shower in the locker room. He'd drive to the towns with the mask on. I mean, he'd be in his house with the mask. I mean, if he left his house, the mask was coming on. He went to the grocery store with it on. And Bob Armstrong told me that no one 
put two and two together, that was Johnny Walker because he was out of the territory for like a year before he came back as Mr. Wrestling too. And they, you know, he was so kayfabe those weekly towns. People were trying to figure out who he was. And Bob Armstrong was going around telling everyone that he was a German named Herman Schwartz. Huh. So he called Johnny Walker Herm until Johnny died. He called him Herm every day. That was his nickname for Johnny wow. Walker. You know, that, wow. and that's hilarious when you brought up the shower thing, because I remember there was a masked tag team called the Masked Medics, Mysterious Masked Medics. Of course, there were many, many different medics over yeah. the over the years. But the original medics, which were, um, oh, boy, Don uh, Don Lorty. Um, yeah. And uh, Tony Gonzalez. Tony Gonzalez. Thank you. Yeah. It was on the tip of my tongue. They were actually, they took the gimmick and they had photographers, but they were in wrestling. I think it was wrestling review magazine where they were in the showers with a soap all over them, but they had the masks on as they were in the shower. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they just showed the upper top, half of them, you know, we didn't get to see the, yeah. The other parts, thankfully. Yeah. yeah, that was the gimmick. You know, they even shower with their masks on. You know, it, it, the lengths they took, and uh, the assassins were in that clip. And boy, I'll tell you what: uh, Tom Ernesto, Jody Hamilton. I don't think there were any guys that were as good in that gimmick. But all over the country, the infernos, the medics, the interns, the spoilers, the super destroyers. You name it, every territory had it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I, tell you, I like, that, um, I like that Jody version. Walker. Oh, sorry, Adam, go ahead. I was just going to say that version of the Assassins we saw because Lance Russell was the announcer. So that was actually Don Bass and Roger Smith. And yes. not only did they do in one territory, they did Fire and Flame, the Assassins, the Medics. The interns. Smith and was one they, of the. And I think they did yeah. one more, but it was all them. They got like a three or four year run with Jarrett in the late seventies, early eighties, and just about every six months they just changed that mask outfit after they were done with the program and go to another one. And the fans could, I guess, never figure it out that it was the same two guys. Smith was also one of the infernos at yeah. different times. Yep. Yeah. I liked uh, Mr. Wrestling 2 and the UWF when he turned against uh, Magnum TA. That was a great yeah. turn. And he was just showed how um, an all-time babyface could could turn into a heel. And it's unfortunate um, as our knowledge crept up and we see these videotapes now, we go, look how short he was. Oh, my God. But he was so believable, right? Uh, put, putting Johnny Walker against Terry Allen uh, side by side. And it's like, oh, well, you know, there's no contest here. But yeah, he was very convincing as a heel uh, masked guy. In a, in a twist of uh, masked wrestlers, what I thought was unique, and this took place in the 80s, the Killer Bees put on masks at the yeah. end of the match to confuse the referee. And I thought that was, I always thought that that was a great uh, thing that they did there. Um, they, they were called masked confusion. Remember that? Masked confusion, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And the story goes supposedly that Billy Red Lions had told them about using the masks uh, mm -hmm. because that's what him and Crusader Dewey Robertson used in Toronto. Yeah. For a couple, for oh, a very good. As the Crusaders, right? They were yeah. a, face, a face team, and uh, you, you, guys, you guys should put the masks on at the end of the match to confuse that everything. And it's just good guys <laughs> cheating, right? Right. Yeah, that was, a, that was a fun gimmick that they did there with that, putting the mask on at the end. Um, Chris, I mean, we have two. We, we, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who was that? I just want to say, well, first, I just learned like 18 months ago who the missing link was, and I'm still shocked. Nice. Joey Robertson. Yeah, I was stunned. Ah. And then secondly, in one of those clips, you guys can explain it to me. I thought I saw a double ring. Like there was two rings yeah. side by side. What was that? What was that? That was because they had a battle royal in the Houston promotion on that card. Thank you. Oh wow. Okay. Vern so Gagne like, like, what, like a forty man had... battle royal or something, or Vern Gagne did that. Uh... Ring, but it always looked. Houston always looked bigger than twenty feet. Uh, it was a pretty big ring. Uh -huh. It might have been bigger than twenty feet. So both those rings being in there side by side, yeah, that's a pretty impressive. They used to call those what was it? Two ring triple chance battle royal. Yeah. Right. Okay. And I was going to say, Vern Gagne did that a couple of times with his one of his annual battle royals in the 70s. He had two rings side by side. 
you'd have wrestlers in ring one. And the idea was, is they had to be tossed into ring two and then continue their battle. Uh-huh. And then the winners of the two rings would meet oh, wow. in a match. Yeah. And we had one match where um, Andre was in the battle Royal. So, you know, he's always the odds on favorite, Yeah, but he got tossed and however they did it. And uh, th- they have a main event that way. Different angle, you know, I never really cared for him because Battle Royals for me, just me, there was so much going on that so much got lost. I'd rather just see a tag team match or two guys going at it. But Battle Royals drew once a year, so it it made sense to do them. Yeah, they're still doing them today. They got one planned for uh, SummerSlam tonight. They're doing a 25-man Battle Royal, uh, so that should be interesting. But, yeah, they're still using that that to this day. Um, You know, I'll tell you, Charlie – I like. Oh, yeah, I've always liked the Royal Rumble idea. Believe it or I not, I love the Royal Rumble. My I favorite the yeah. with the idea that two guys start out and then they alleged every two minutes a new opponent comes in. I thought that back when it started, it's not often that I've agreed with Vince over the years, <laughs> but I thought that was a very in- innovative way to uh, you know. And then you have the idea of who went the longest time time limit wise, yeah. you know, and made a big deal of it. I, that was a good, a good concept. Yes. And I'll never forget the, uh, when, when entrance one and two were both members of demolition and they wasted no time going at each other, man. They just beat the crap out of each other until the third guy came in. So yeah, always been a huge fan of the Royal rumble. I love the concept. Yes. Uh, guys, why don't we, uh, we're going to run a commercial break here. We're going to take a little break and then we got a couple more clips on the other side of it. And, uh, we'll be right back. We'll check in with our sponsors here. Digits nine, eight, eight, can save a life. If you or someone you know is having thoughts of suicide or experiencing a mental health or substance use crisis, 988 provides connection to free confidential support. There is hope. The lifeline works. For 24-7 confidential support, just call, text, or chat 988. Welcome back, Falls County Anywhere Podcast, and thank you again to each and every one of our sponsors. John, Charlie, and Chris here with you with uh, wrestling historians George Shire, Wes Maidman, and from the Wrestling Legends Network, Mr. Adam Parsons. Guys, we've got some more clips loaded up. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, we got two more clips, and they're each of a classic territory. John, let's roll it. Thank you. 
And a time limit, welcoming back these two fine wrestlers to the Gulf Coast area. First time my life from Bonifay, Florida, at 220 pounds, <laughs> here is Greg Peterson. The voice. Greg Peterson. <laughs> His opponent tonight from Lowry, Alabama, at 222 pounds, we introduce to you now, Dynamite Dick Donovan. Dick Dunn, excuse me, Dick Dunn. <laughs> D.D. We know who they are. The original bloodline. Well, uh, that clip was called NWA Golf Coast, and uh, Adam, why don't you start us off? So that was uh, the Fields family um, had that first, and they were wrestling promoters, um, were in stock car racing. I think later on, the boys are more interested in stock car racing than wrestling. Um, and not that they were bad wrestlers, but they weren't the greatest wrestlers in the world and were kind of undersized. Of course, that ends up being sold to Robert Fuller. And then the Fuller family ended up having that as well. And I believe the Fields family and the Fullers are cousins somehow. I think they're also related, but I'm not 100% certain on that. But I think they are cousins to the Fields is how that ended up getting to them. But territory heavily based on wrestling, not based on a lot of gimmicks. Um, and the one thing that I always thought was really cool about that territory, it was the same guys, was Ron Robert Fuller. You'd have Bob Armstrong would be there. Um, you'd have Jerry Stubbs would be there. And the same guys would be there, and you go about three years later, and it's the exact same guys, but all the guys that were baby faces three years ago were heels, and all the guys that were heels are now baby faces. And they would just keep – their basically their whole family and their best friends would stay right there in that territory for years on end, and they still drew. Fans never got tired of them. It's, it's uh, a little bit of an unknown territory for me personally. I mean, I see, I saw these guys and I recognize all the names, Adam, but uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, a million miles away from me hmm. in, being in Canada. It's absolutely. Yeah. And uh, those kind of things you, we need to preserve, we need to learn about so that it's, it, the history is saved. Right. Uh, I thanks for Chris for keeping those um, videos, but yeah, it's, it's, you know how many people really know who Jerry Stubbs was? I mean, he had a he did get around a little bit, but the Fields boys they 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 didn't get around that much at all. You know, uh, Jerry Stubbs. I think he did the mask gimmick we were talking about. He did, wasn't he, yes. Mister Olympia or yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, yep. And when you mentioned the Gulf Coast, um, it was one of those territories back in the day where. If you even looked at the national magazines, you know, most of the national wrestling magazines would always cover a lot of New York or, or WWF guys at the time. But occasionally you'd get your NWA guys in there, you get your AWA, WWA, etc. But the Gulf Coast, it seemed like one of those territories that I can relate to the magazines. I think maybe just once or twice you'd get a picture, a photo feature or something. And you'd have guys like Bill Bowman and Joe Turner uh cowboy bob kelly he was a huge favorite down there for a long yeah. time yeah and i had a chance to be down there with with those guys uh about a decade ago at one of their reunions and uh when bob kelly was still with us and so was bill bowman etc such camaraderie that's one of the things when you mentioned like the fields and and the family there was i i just noticed immediately what a camaraderie what a closeness what a just a close-knit uh, kinship there was with that territory 
And yes, they didn't get a lot of the bigger talent in there. We saw Hickerson and Condry, who were, you know, still low key before they got to the bigger time. Yeah. And it was it was a territory that deserves, like you said, Wes, to be preserved because there was a lot of talent and a lot of great matches. And Bob Kelly, Cowboy Bob Kelly, one of the favorites, he had a long running feud with Don Fargo. Uh, and both of them, Bob Kelly actually said that Donnie Fargo was one of the, the most unique guys and fun guys to work with because you could pretty much do anything. And their matches were, you know, that was huge. So it was, it was a good territory, really was. Well, just a quick plug there for the Wrestling Legends Network. You can get three ninety nine dollars a month, and you can get all kinds of great classic wrestling territories that uh, Adam and his family provide us, great classic wrestling fans, and you just love it. And you can order great DVDs like I did of the Nick Goulas Mid-American Territory. I can't wait for more, Adam. <laughs> and uh, let's roll our next clip. A young hot rod. NWA San Francisco territory and San Francisco uh, studio there. Uh, Adam, some great footage. I wish there was a lot more. Yeah, it's just one of those territories that has really been um, lost over time as far as footage goes. There's very, very little of that out there. And what is out there sometimes isn't the best quality. Um, but they were, you had the Tolis brothers were there. Um, but there was a lot of really, really young guys that were in the part of that territory there in the 70s. You know, Buddy Rose, uh, Ron Starr was a bit, you got a big push there. Roddy Piper was very young there. So it was a lot of young guys, but a lot of those guys went on to have great, great careers. You know, when you mentioned Roddy Piper and Buddy Rose, uh, I am very familiar with both of them. Buddy Rose, of course, Paul Pershman, he was from Pershman. here, from, from Minneapolis, and he uh, had his training from Vern Gagne, came out of the camp as Paul Pershman, went on to become Buddy Rose. I think in that one clip you had uh, the mask guy, was that Texas Red? Yes, sir. So that would have been Red Bastine? Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, Bastine, you know, he worked with Buddy in, in that territory. Uh, and that's another thing, that mask gimmick again. How many people would have guessed at the time that Red Bastine was Texas Red and working as a heel? I wanted to mention Roddy Piper. Uh, you talk about, we talked early in the program about how Andre beat the crap out of Bigelow. Yeah. Well, I will tell you on All Star Wrestling, our TV program here, when Roddy Piper came down from Winnipeg during one of his... Very, very first matches. The guy was green as grass. 
<laughs> and just a scrawny, skinny kid. He had a match on TV against, of all people, Larry Hennig. Now, Larry Hennig, I'm going to tell you something. There's another guy that was legit tough. I mean, Larry just was legit tough. And he, I wish that match was on tape from the All-Star Wrestling because he, and I think Roddy talked about this in his book, uh, Larry just pounded the crap out of him. Just kind of like, I'm going to teach you, kid, that if you want to be in this business. And Larry bragged about it, that, you know, he he was going to make sure that Roddy Piper understood that this isn't always a work. And uh, Roddy got his behind handed to him. Very interesting. <laughs> West. The uh, it's funny when um, I moved to uh, Manitoba and I started branching out with l meeting wrestling people here. Everybody's got a Roddy Piper story. Everybody, and it's, it's like, oh, he played on top of his van at funerals, the bagpipes. Um, he, uh, <laughs> you know, he learned how to play the bagpipes uh, with a marching band that. Um, some Mason people uh, were part of, and it's just really interesting to see. Now, believe me, one of my favorites all time, whether he was a good guy or a bad guy, he, he was just so good. I, I loved him. I absolutely loved him. His mouth was so, it was like, his mouth was as fast as his punches. And yeah. he was really, really great. Um, San Francisco, another area that, because it's a little out of the way from where I was based at the time in, in Ontario, we, you know, we didn't see much. I think uh, Barnheiser was one of the uh, photographers, Larry Barnheiser. Mm -hmm. and he used to do magazine spreads in some of the magazines, not the after magazines that much. <laughs> um, we used to get uh, Mo Mosca was out there for a while. And yeah, the Samoans were out there. Uh, interesting area. Uh, how And California split in two, sort of. So it was kind of interesting that there wasn't many guys that went back and forth. But it was two different kind of promotions from the L.A., and the San Fran. You know, I thought it was interesting, Wes, you just touched on Roddy Piper about his uh, his mouth. Um, I think it's safe to say that a lot of the kayfabe era wrestlers, uh, even if they didn't have sometimes the best talent in the world, if they could get over with their interviews, which many of them did, um, and if they had the skills like Roddy did, the ability to, to work in the ring and then have the mouth to boot, I mean, there's no way that those guys couldn't succeed. Yeah. And the interesting thing is those interviews, this goes needs to be said again, those interviews with those guys, they weren't scripted, kids. Yeah. They, they, they knew the town they were going to be in. They knew the wrestler they were going to be in the program with or where they were at what point in the program. And they knew they had their two or three minutes on TV to get the match over, get the fans to run to the off the box office. And they were unscripted. Unlike today where, you know, the guys have to memorize a, a book before they can go out and do their match. Yeah. It's uh, overkill. Yeah. yeah it, and it is. And they go on, they go on for 15 minutes and sometimes it's like, what, what are you trying to get across here? You know, but uh, definitely an interesting and guys like Piper and Ray Stevens and Mad Dog Vashon and and uh, Nick Bockwinkle and the Mass Superstar, all these guys, their interview skills, wow. Yeah, and you know, and another note on Piper, I mean, the Piper's pit was just as, as famous as he was as a wrestler. Yes. Just that interview segments, I mean, the yeah. coconut uh, to Snuka's head. We saw earlier, we saw Snuka in that clip. And, of course, the Andre Hogan showdown before WrestleMania three. So Piper's pit, even on its own, was just unbelievable at the time. Well, you know what? Interesting. This goes way back. But when you think of a guy like uh, George Wagner, who became Gorgeous George, like one of the first blonde heels, the long, fancy robes. And, the you know, he was playing more of the feminine character in the ring with the blonde curly hair permed no less with a permanent and it was his it was his ability he didn't have the greatest ability in the ring guys right. and any wrestler that worked with him they would say you know when you went in the ring with george you literally had to carry him make him better than he was but 
his strutting, his arrogance, his cockiness, and his ability to get over on that interview and the insulting of the fans, box office, man. And, and of course, in that era, you know, because we're going back to the 50s and the very early 60s. I mean, it was unheard of to have a character like that in the business. And uh, it, that was so much a part of it. Well, it's like some, some of the people that we've seen over the years, I could never understand why they put someone with someone. Like, say, for example, why they would have put the Grand Wizard or Abdullah Farouk with Billy, uh, Billy Graham, Superstar Graham. Superstar Graham was great. Like, he didn't need someone to speak. Yes, it kind of doubled the amplification of, of his persona. But again, we've talked about this before, George, uh, and I still... I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but Heenan and Bockwinkle was was just like a waste. Well, I, I will touch on that, Wes, because, you know, I agree with you. Both of those guys individually had the, the mouth, the skills to get over. But it was interesting with Nick and Bobby because for whatever reason, having the two together just made it that much better, especially when Nick was champ. Um, I think a lot of fans, you know, Nick was that kind of a champion where you realize that he had the, he had the talent, he had the wrestling skills, but he'd have to do these little things to get, yeah. you know, attention or get disqualified. Heenan was the caveat in all of that yeah. and the distraction or that sort of thing. But no, he didn't need Bobby Heenan, nor did Bobby need Nick as far as interviews go. Yeah. So you're right on that. And, you and know, I, the, thing, the thing about WWF at the time with they had the three managers out there, Blassie, right. Wizard, and uh, Albano, um, I, it, it just was, I guess it was Vince Sr.'s idea that every heel needed to have this, this character outside the ring yeah, or to do his talking for them. But generally speaking, the manager was usually just put with a guy who couldn't put a sentence together on the right. mic. Yeah, and, then, yeah. and I will tell you this, when Hulk Hogan came into the AWA, he was, I, I used that green as grass uh, thing a minute ago. Uh, he come in as a heel. Vern wanted him to be a heel. And if you look on YouTube, it's out there. There's an interview that's being done. He's got luscious Johnny Valiant as his manager. And of course, we all know the talking ability for, for Johnny Valiant. I mean, yeah, he was yeah. he was gold. Um, but Hulk Hogan, if you listen to the interview, he stumbles and stutters over his his comments. He was he could not put a um, sentence together. So he needed a manager if he was going to be a heel. And then Vern and Greg and Bobby Heenan, they worked with Hulk. Um, and that's something you're not going to hear out there from the average person. But they worked with Hulk and said, here's what you need to do. Here's how you need to project. Say yeah. this, do that. That was Bobby Heenan way back in the AWA when Hogan became a baby face. That's so, a, um, the perfect segue, George. I wanted to ask your guys' opinion. We talked about it a little bit before we started recording. Uh, Bobby Heenan was mentioned so uh, recently. So what, what happened was, uh, I don't know, maybe some of you saw it, maybe you didn't, but on first take on ESPN, um, Stephen A. Smith, of course, and Molly Quirum uh, hosting it. Uh, they had brought in um, Paul Heyman and Roman Reigns. And Stephen A. Smith asked uh, Paul Heyman, you know, are you the greatest manager of all time? He said, yeah, I'm the GOAT. And then Stephen A. said, well, what about Bobby Heenan? And he said, well, he's irrelevant. He's dead. Paraphrasing a little bit, but he made a point where he's dead. And, and, he's, and he also said, and uh, Jimmy Hart is proof that God doesn't answer my prayers because he's still alive. And it got a lot of controversy online. But then a couple days later, uh, Paul Heyman posted on his Facebook page a picture of him and Jimmy Hart kind of having a conversation backstage. And Paul Heyman stated, you know, without Jimmy Hart uh, teaching me a lot of the business, I wouldn't be where I'm at today, giving him his props there. Um, I looked at it immediately as a work um, when he mentioned that about Bobby Heenan. A lot of comments on social media was Bobby Heenan would appreciate that sort of thing because he was keeping the kayfabe going. What was your guys' thoughts on him saying that sort of thing? Well, I'll I I'll take it. it first. I'll take it first. Well, go, go ahead, ahead, Adam, if you want go to. Ahead, Adam. Go, go ahead. No, no, sir. Go right, go right ahead, sir. The, the thing with Bobby Heenan and that comment, um, I would take it as a work, but they also, you know, the modern wrestling – they don't want you to remember anything that happened. And so at this point in time, Bobby 
Heenan would be irrelevant. They don't want fans to go back and remember him. But if Paul Heyman was being honest, and I, I do know Paul Heyman a little bit from years ago, not current uh, character that he's been in. Um, by all means, he knows that Bobby Heenan was the real goat. And every manager out there, trust me, they would look to Bobby Heenan and say, he's the guy that set the bar and we all had to rise up to it. Yeah. Nobody. And I don't care. I, I'm not being prejudiced here because I got a, a big dose of Bobby Heenan for, you know, 30 years uh, in our territories, but Bobby Heenan, he did, he set that bar so high that anyone else uh, would have to be fighting for number two. And that's, that's my opinion. But I think Paul Heyman, I mean, I'm going to give him his due. I think in his, his career here as an advocate, they don't call him a manager anymore. Isn't he an advocate? The advocate, advisor, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Whatever it is. Um, I think he does great in the role he's playing with what he's being paid and told to do. And he does it very well. Yeah. So, uh, But is he as great as Bobby Heenan? None of the guys we could make a list of guys. I'm, and that's and this can be my opinion, but none of them will be number one. Heenan has it, period. I agree. I was at, Adam, I was was or West, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, Adam, Adam. I think it was work, obviously, but Bob number one without a doubt. The uh, I was asked on Facebook by someone about it, and I, I commented that it's very generational. I'm not going to say that Heenan wasn't probably the best, for sure. His in-ring work, because he was a great wrestler, he took fantastic tumbles out of the ring, over the top rope and over the turnbuckles. You can't deny that. And at the time he spent being a wrestler, then being a small-time manager in like the WWA, moving on to the AWA, and then let alone his massive career with the WWF as a commentator slash manager. It, 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 you, unparalleled, right? But it's generational because there was, we're not old enough to have seen Wild Red Berry in the WWF, who was supposedly one of the best talkers. <clears throat> Uh, in Toronto, we had Abdullah Farouk for the Sheik. And because the Sheik never talked, the mouthpiece was the gimmick. It was everything. Um, uh, uh, J.C. Dykes was always in the magazines from the South. Different guys from different territories were the cat's ass. And that's, you know, people will say Paul Heyman, this and um, Cornette, for example, or Jimmy yeah. Hart. These guys were all, they're all top guys because... They didn't wrestle and they were still in vogue and on the front covers of magazines. Massive talent to get there. Um, I like Jimmy Cornett because he's outspoken, but I never saw him live. I never saw, the, the, you know, just videotapes. So how can I, I didn't see him week after week on TV either. So how can we comment? George, like you said, you saw a huge dose of heat and, and I get it. That's why he is, I would say, yes, number one. Yeah. You know, I I point this out when you pointed out uh, about generational. I think that's very interesting to put it that way because let's be honest. Um, and I'm the oldest guy here. I'm going to take credit for this, but there are a lot of people that are younger than I am, a lot younger that never saw Bobby Heenan. They never. And, and you said those that didn't get to see uh, Wild Red Berry. I've seen clips of Wild Red Berry when he was managing the Kangaroos, and yeah. the guy had a mouth on him. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned uh, J.C. Dykes, and you know, you mentioned Abdullah Farouk. You know, how many people today would know that that was the Grand Wizard? You know, in a different uh, incarnation, and yeah. Abdullah the Farouk or Abdullah Farouk, um, Ernie Roth, his real name. He had many different managerial yeah. names. He was Jay Wellington Radcliffe. He was uh, he managed Magnificent Maurice and Handsome Johnny Barron for a while. When you talk about feminine characters for the era, yeah. you know Bur Maurice and Barron played that. Uh, he used the name Mister Clean as a manager, hmm. and uh, but yeah, Gentleman Saul with the Germans. Yeah. You know when you talk about great managers and the way he could talk. Not to mention the fact that he was, the, the whole gimmick was he was Jewish 
with German wrestlers. Yeah. I mean, let's let's start a war here. Let's get controversy. Let's get heat. It wasn't, you know. Uh, so, yeah, Bobby Heenan, we can say he was the best, but every territory had some classic guys. Bobby Davis, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, we had Bobby Davis for a coffee break in the AWA when he was going to introduce the Alaskan Jay York as his champion. But he managed Buddy Rogers, yeah. a mouthpiece, and I've got, I've got clips of him shooting it off. And you talk about Mr. Arrogance that you want to see get popped. <laughs> so, yeah, managers were so vital, so important, uh, in most cases, to the overall character of a wrestler that to ever overlook any of them guys. Yeah. From Paul Heyman on down, it, it isn't fair. It just isn't fair. Uh, real quick, uh, and then Charlie, I'll hand it to you for our jobber of the week. Uh, yeah. We uh, rest in peace to, uh, uh, you mentioned George, gorgeous George, but uh, on the same wavelength, we just lost uh, the exotic Adrian Street. So rest yeah. in peace to him and uh, condolences to his wife, Linda, and their family. Also, yeah, and also, Chris, on top of that, uh, you know, continue prayers out to Steve Malgo McMichael. They, he's, uh, they just said he just went to ICU, and he's in really rough shape battling ALS. So it's a tough battle, but our, our prayers and thoughts are with uh, with Mongo. Yeah, very definitely. And your uh, jobber of the week. Yeah, let's uh, fire it up here, guys. We got our uh, weekly uh, jobber, our enhancement talent of the week uh, that we want to bring up here. And uh, for this week is a uh, – John, if you have it ready there. Uh, Mr. George Anderson. Yeah, now this guy, um, he, you know, he had the singlet on there. You know, he's ready to go. Um, now, this was unique because when I looked up George Anderson, I, I'll go to, like, YouTube and, like, try to screenshot some of their matches. Uh, he was going one-on-one uh, -on -one in a match that I found here with a wrestler known as Abe Knuckleball Schwartz, which I found out was uh, Steve Lombardi. Yeah. Uh, and we talked about, too, in the past that some of these jobbers and enhancement talents should be considered for the Hall of Fame. You know, as soon as I heard Steve Lombardi, I was like, oh, wow, Brooklyn Brawler. Uh, so here's uh, Knuckleball Smith here, or Knuckleball Schwartz, rather, putting a <laughs> duplex on Mr. George Anderson. And uh, it was Knuckleball Schwartz, the uh, uh, ripoff Mr. Met, as John said, as we were talking off to the side there, um, ended up coming out with the win. That gimmick didn't last very long. Uh, he basically had baseball face paint. And this he came out during... Um, the MLB strike that happened back in 94. So I don't know if the point of that was to just bring a baseball personality while the MLB was on strike and then kind of have like a, a pissed off baseball player coming in there and, and roughing people up, but it really didn't work. But uh, George Anderson wrestled from 1990 to 1995. He's out of North Dakota. He had an 0 and 25 record. Um, but again, a five year span with 25 matches is pretty solid. So a shout out to Mr. George Anderson and to Abe Knuckleball Schwartz, Steve Lombardi, as our both of our jobbers of the week. Uh, but of course, Knuckleball coming out with the uh, with the win there. So I found that very interesting that those two guys went at it, I, and it was a TV uh, match, so it wasn't like a dark match or anything. And you could tell the fans really weren't that invested in that one. Uh, it was kind of kind of a dull crowd there. George's got a pretty good build on him. Yeah, pretty solid. You know, he's got a nice first name too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Yeah, I mean George Anderson. I mean he they could have gave him something a little more menacing. You know what I mean it's like somebody from like the accounting department coming yes. down to rub up somebody. You know, so well, yeah, you know, it, it was interesting, Charlie, when you talk about knuckleball and being Lombardi. You know, he was in many different guises too, and we'll never right. get the credit he deserves for being as talented as he was. But he was one. The guys of that era, they knew their place. They played their they played their gimmick or lack thereof that they were uh, supposed to do. And Lombardi, yeah, just a just a class guy. Absolutely. I mean, what he did with different, uh, I mean, he deserves more than he'll ever get. Let's put yeah, it definitely. that way. Yeah, they like I said, they should have like a enhancement talent or like jobber wing of the uh, the well. The imaginary Hall of Fame that's in yeah, Vince McMahon's yeah. head. Well, if Vince um, McMahon does it, it doesn't count. If they want to put a, a wing in the other Halls of Fame that have real buildings around them, I'm I'm all for it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be a lot of fun. But right. uh, I'll tell you what, gentlemen, this is always a pleasure um, hearing the perspectives of two great historians. Adam, you're a great historian in your own right at a young age. Uh, so 
we we thank yeah. you guys so much uh, for contributing to the show as you guys do once a month, and uh, we just love hearing the uh, the backstories and the information you guys provide to anybody checking us out. So we thank you guys so much again, Mr. Uh, Wes Maidman, Mr. George Shire, and Mr. Adam Parsons. Thank you so Welcome. much. Again. Great to meet you, Adam. Yeah, Appreciate you, what Adam. you're doing and keep it up. It's fun. Yes, sir. To both Wade, of you guys. Oh, nice or, you well. uh, Wes, always nice to see you, man. Yep. And then you three stooges up at the top of the screen here. I love all of you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. We love all of you. Thank you. Love you guys. Take care, guys. Thanks. We'll see you again soon. All right. Yeah. All right, guys. As uh, as always, uh, just just great stuff with those gentlemen. Um, whether they're in a solo uh, capacity with us or as a group, always good stuff. So great yeah. to hear it, uh, guys. Of course, tonight uh, being August fifth, it is SummerSlam tonight in Detroit. Kind of an underwhelming main event, if you ask me. We got Jay Uso uh, in, in the Bloodline going up against Roman Reigns in a tribal combat match. We'll see what happens. Rumors are swirling that there might be some outside interference going on. They've reported that Randy Orton is in Detroit, uh, Bray Wyatt potentially, or maybe nothing happens at all because sometimes that happens too where we're speculating on rumors and then nothing happens. So we'll see what happens there. But next week on the Falls Can Anywhere podcast, we will be recapping uh, all of the happenings at SummerSlam tonight in Detroit. So tune into the Peacock Network. That'll be on tonight. I know that's what I'll be doing on my Saturday night. Um, but guys, let's, uh, I know I started out the show with a public service announcement. I don't know if we have anything fired up here, John, for the, uh, for the people. Sure we do. Um, this is something we got to really all, you know, pay attention to. It's 844-794-3812. It's mental health. It's a 24 hour hotline. It is obviously every day of the year, 365 days, Christmas, whatever. Um, if you have, are suffering from depression, uh, PTSDs, nightmares, trauma, you know, all that, anything that just gets you upset or you're, you're, you feel like you're, you can't go on. You don't want to get out of bed in the morning. You're that depressed. And that happens to all of us. Call 844-794-3812. There are professionals standing by 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They'll help you. They'll find places within your community. If you want that, if you don't, it's anonymous. You could just call them every single day. Every, they don't care. They'll stick with you for hours. Just don't, don't do anything until you talk to somebody because they're there right. and they'll help you. And it's not as bad as you think, but I understand when it does feel bad that you need somebody. It's a crazy world these days. Make that call. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, and before we sign off here, uh, John, with your help, we'd like to thank our fans across all our platforms for tuning in with us. Almost two years coming up already um, here, our home on Facebook uh, there's our YouTube friends with the Z media network, put that in on YouTube under the search all together. And you can find not just this show, but John sports spitball and podcast and the other shows that we all have here. Our Twitter is at count anywhere, which is growing. I talk to people every day from all over the country. And uh, also we are still on Spotify and um, John real quick, our Facebook star program. Yes, guys, you see at the start of the show, um, the stars pop up um, in the message board. If you have 99 cents and uh, you, you've you got it to, to spare, if you send us uh, 99 cents, it gives us 100 stars. That 100 stars collects and um, we are then capable of getting other advertising just through Facebook, where just be, you know, we get monetized that way. So that 99 cents helps us a ton, gives 100 stars. If you like giving, if you give me a $5, it gives us 500 stars. So um, you, if you feel or you can give it, you know, send it on the way, we will use it for good, of course, because those 99 cents will go right back into our show. Maybe it helps us go somewhere on location, helps us do things, um, you know, to modernize us even more than we already are. So that's the stars program. And I appreciate everybody that has done it already too. Yeah. yeah. For the price, for the price of a cup of coffee, you can help us out. And, uh, yeah. Maybe we can put that towards uh, getting some other guests on here as well. So, um, but yeah, guys, uh, great show as always, Chris, the, the great legendary clips that you're able to provide is awesome as always. Gentlemen, great show today. And again, thank you to all of our guests, uh, George Sire, Wes Maven, and Mr. Adam Parsons. Uh, we thank you all. And uh, we'll see you guys again next week as we talk some SummerSlam and do that recap. And we'll see you guys again soon. Yes. Thank you.